So today is Saturday, October 22nd, 2016. So let's resume with uh, number five, and we'll begin with the poems, which are always so terrific. If you remember, the oxerting uh, pictures are from 12th century China. There was an earlier version, more around in 10th century, that the 12th century one uh, in 10 pictures uh, really sums up the entire pre process of the bodhisattva's uh, uh, recognition of self-nature and embodying that in the world amidst all the difficulties, dusts, and issues we're each going to face uh, with a broad grin in the end on his face. So, if even the slightest thought arises, this is five is taming the ox, not yet riding it, but taming it. If even the slightest thought arises, then another interact inexorably follows it in an endless round. Certainly this know, uh, we certainly know this to be true. Through awakening, everything becomes truth. Through blindness, it becomes error. Uh, if I get this quote right, you know, I don't remember exactly, Roshi Kaplow used to say something like, uh, a right person, the right person can take something false and by saying it, make it true. Uh, a false person, a person not really there, can take a true statement and by saying it, make it false. So the Oxfording pictures say, through awakening, everything becomes truth. Through blindness, it becomes error. Thoughts arise not from the surroundings, but out of the herdsman's own mind. Hold the rein tight and do not allow yourself any wavering. Hold the rein tight, of course, means pay attention to your practice. Don't go wandering off in your head. Uh, it's just this breath. Right now. Let everything else go. Aiken Roshi used to say, sink into Mu. Let Mu breathe Mu. Now the poems. The herdsman must not for a moment drop whip or rain, or else the ox would stampede into the dust. But if the ox is patiently tamed and gentled, he will follow the herdsman by himself, without fetter or chain. There comes a point in our practice. You know, it's not that you're wielding a uh, whip or rain. Uh, you just use them without really thinking about it when you lose your practice. You don't sit there and beat yourself up. You just go back to or back to the koan point. Not thinking about the koan point necessarily, but just being it. And eventually, uh, the ox uh, kind of is with us wherever we are. We don't have to go looking for it. Hey, where are you this morning, ox? Uh, we don't have to lasso it and pull it back. Uh, it's just there, and uh, we can lead it along because it's willingly uh, working along with us. It's a patient ox. Oxes carry burdens. Uh, it's no longer wild. This is a wonderful thing, very encouraging time in our practice. We'll follow the herdsman without fetter or chain. Poem two. Sometimes the ox stays in the mountain forest enjoying himself, or goes along the much traveled road where he gets covered with the dust of the horses. Never does he touch the fodder growing in the fields of others. Coming and going require no effort on the part of the herdsman. Peacefully, the ox carries him. Uh, in the commentary, you'll see the uh, master Otsu, who wrote the commentaries uh, for these versions, says that's not quite correct. Um, I'll show you the picture in a minute before I slide off my cushion, though. Let me straighten this out. Uh, the picture uh, for the fifth, Taming the Ox, let's see if everyone can see this all wandered around is leading the ox. Uh, 
The herdsman is not yet riding the ox. So he says, no, 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 you can't say peacefully the ox carries him. And he says, uh, it was a little error that crept into uh, uh, these verses long ago. Uh, very important too. Uh, you can go along the much traveled road. Uh, get covered with all the problems of work and family and life. That's fine. That's the much traveled road. You're going to get covered with dust on your when you're on it. You can't avoid that. That's fine. Or uh, sometimes the ox stays in the mountain forest enjoying himself. Just uh, being completely with whatever you're doing. What a relief. No more buzzing thoughts. No more... Me and you, just the incense rising, just the candle burning, just the pain in the knees, just there for a moment. Uh, and not touching the fodder growing in the fields of others. Uh, we don't have to compare ourselves to others, not at all. Uh, we each have an integrity that goes right down into our DNA, into the nature of the universe. Where else are you going to take your stand? Uh, but in that vast open space that lies behind every cell. We don't have to go trying to get what someone else has got. Uh, we can be free of that, breath by breath. In fact, at some point, it's healthier to be free of that. Now, third poem. Through patient training, the ox has got used to the herdsmen and become gentle. Even when he gets into the dust, you cannot make him dirty. Blake has a line, the soul of sweet delight can never be defiled. Even when he gets into the dust, it cannot make him dirty. Long and patient taming, through suddenly crashing right down, the herdsman has gained his entire fortune. Long and patient training, and then one day, Everything falls away, and there's your fortune. You didn't have to build it up ruble by ruble, coin by coin. It was there all along, but everything has to fall away for you to find your fortune. But it takes long, patient training for suddenly something to happen. It's like that old saw about the actor who, after... 20 years in the sticks playing summer stock suddenly becomes a star. Suddenly. I would talk to that person and find out about all the work they put into that suddenly. Long and patient taming. Through suddenly crashing right down, the herdsman has gained his entire fortune. Under the trees, other people encounter his booming laugh everything falls away. Laughter. Peals of laughter. There's a Tolkien story, uh, last line of which might be Leaf by Niggle, which if you don't know it is one of the really profound stories about death and change. The last line is something, laugh, the hills rang with it. It's like that. Great booming laugh. Falling is gaining, and all is lost. Aha! There it is. All self-centeredness, finally, gone. Of course, it's momentary. Much hard work remains. So now the commentaries. For number five, first the entrance, the... Uh, Opening verse. The herdsman really caught the ox at the preceding stage, but he may be attached to him precisely because of this. Yes, the herdsman still got a problem. The herdsman still thinking, I've got it. And he goes, oops, oops, no, no, no. Oh, I'm, yeah, I've seen that. Now I'm free of thinking I've got it. And then, oops, oops. It's an endless process. That, that herdsman, he got us to keep working at it. To undo this attachment and to be able to liberate himself from the ox, he must tame him. Here, the training after the breakthrough begins, which consists in bringing the ox and ourselves to be one pure whole, 
in all doing or leaving, and in all the circumstances of daily life. Haku and Zenji, the author of or Zazen Wasen, Song and Praise of Zazen, says it's really after uh, some uh, initial insight that uh, uh, the post uh, uh, Kensho training of uh, koan practice really becomes crucial. Uh, and it's something we continue, uh, uh, continue to continue. Uh, it's crucial. Uh, it's not an add-on. Oh, now I've got it, and uh, okay, well, this is fun to do. No, it's crucial. Uh, that's the point being made here. At the same time, taming means letting our self and beings come to pure unity in which the self sinks into beings and vice versa. As the old masters say, it is extremely difficult to let this unity always persist. The breakthrough must, of course, be sudden and instantaneous, but the training afterwards to allow what has been won to constantly persist has to be gradual. Uh, of course, things might not be quite so well ordered. Uh, sometimes uh, there's just enough of a glimmer. You might need, need, not even notice it, but the teacher will. Uh, that gives us enough ground to begin working on so-called subsequent cons. And maybe 20 years later or 30 years later, then everything comes crashing down. And you know what you've got. You know it clearly for yourself. So the order isn't quite as uh, logical in reality. The forward. The awakening breakthrough is in itself a looking back at the nature of the everyday at the same time. The endless succession of thoughts in which numerous worldly passions dwell directly becomes truth in this looking back. In error, the pupil is drawn around by the coming and going of beings. The world of erroneous opinions and the calculating intellect reigns here. In awakening, the endless succession of thoughts becomes the world of truth, the world of nirvana itself. It is through error that it becomes the painful world of birth and death in the sense of being entangled in them, although they do not exist in the primordial reality. Uh, in other words, error is not <clears throat> thoughts. Error is, they're my thoughts. Nothing wrong with thoughts. This is our nature. The human brain thinks thoughts like, a rose bush uh, puts forth roses. It's wonderful. But when the bush starts thinking, those are my roses, then even a rose bush might fall into error. This is all stated from the point of view of so called secondary truth. That is, it's a humble point being made here by the master making the commentaries because he's saying, this is still just talking about it. I'm not demonstrating it for you. The following Zen saying shows how it appears in the light of primary truth. Everything, a line of iron, mountain and sky, a uh, mountain and river, sky and earth, all are in deep black. There's nothing. There is sky, there is river, there is mountain. There's nothing at the same time. They are just as they are, no willows, no flower, all is self, there's no color. The willow is not green, oh, he says, there are no Buddhas above and no worldlings below. There are no Buddhas above and no worldlings below. Here the willow is not green and the flower is not red. Here awakening and non-awakening, erring and non-erring, passion and wisdom do not occur. Not even wisdom to attain. If you remember the Prajna Paramita Radaya, part of Perfect Wisdom Sutra. But one must not stand still in this region of ultimate reality either. There is no realization without reality, and no reality without realization. Without the world of the absolute, there is no world of the relative. 
without non-difference, no difference, and vice versa. In the heart of perfect wisdom, Prajna Paramita, it says all beings are emptiness. Emptiness is all beings. Uh, William Blake uh, uh, has a great line, eternity is in love with the productions of time. The point is the same. As long as we see only, only see either beings or our original nature, as long as we only see things or emptiness, we can never succeed in entering the world of truth. The world of awakening will only open where beings and our original nature are one, which means where we have entered the region of the all one, the unifying concentration at the moment of the great death. Don't let that scare you. Great death. It's a great death. Death to all our stupidities, all our self-centeredness, all the things that drive us crazy, and it's momentary. But to see through all of that at one shot is to find where we've always been, where we've been searching from, where we've been searching for. Don't worry about the language. It's there as a Dharma gate. Dharma gates are countless. I vow to wake to them. It's a Dharma gate, perhaps, to rouse our fear. And look right through that, too. That booming laugh says, there's nothing to be afraid of. Fully letting go is my, says my note. Uh, Just for a moment, fully letting go. This is great death. Maha death, like Maha Yana. When the pupil gets to the bottom of a koan, there is neither the koan nor the searching self. But at the same time, there is the former, just as much as the latter. We don't get rid of ourselves. That would be a really misguided practice to think you're going to get rid of yourself. It would be like saying a fraction, one over two, half, doesn't have a one above the line. There's just two. Can't be. We don't get rid of ourself. But we don't have to uh, turn it into the whole point of everything. This is where the co and self have become one beyond affirmation and negation. If the pupil has succeeded in getting there, he will not be driven around any more by beings. The world of the various phenomena now comes out of his or her original self. The world is the expression of our own nature, our own original self the original face before your parents were even born. Your original face, but it doesn't mean that little you. If it does, you can't laugh a great laugh, just a little laugh. First poem. <clears throat> Whip and rain stand first and foremost for the koans that are set and for the teachings and collections of sayings. When the pupil wants to train and gentle the ox that he must has already made his own, he must hold fast to the koan. In all his doing or leaving, get to the bottom of it and concentrate himself or herself in pure training or the breath practice. Interpret it in relation to your own practice. Don't think it's speaking to someone else because you are or not working on koans, has no bearing. It is relatively easy to attain a sudden breakthrough, but the training afterwards is very hard. To live this, to be transformed by this, this is lifetimes of work. Roshi Kaplow used to say when someone was passed on a first koan, he'd point down to the mat 
put his finger at the very edge of the mat, way out over here. And he'd say, this is where you now are. Congratulations. Uh, this is where you're going. It's going to take quite a long time. That's fine. That's the process. Look at the Jataka tales. The Buddha had thousands of lives to fully get it. It is relatively easy to attain a sudden breakthrough. As they say, all you have to do is sweat blood. All you have to do is break your bones. All you have to do is uh, come to the end of your rope. That's all. You can do it. I know you can. There is always, but the training afterward is very hard. It's persistent. It will never let go of us. We can't turn our back on it. We keep at it. Every situation in life becomes an opportunity to become a little wiser, a little kinder, a little less there, which means everything else. And there is no else. Everything can be more there. This is hard. We fall away from it. The ox goes wandering to the mountaintop or down in the valleys again and again. There is always the danger that the pupil will go astray and fall back into his or her previous world, the world of me, separate from everything else, the world of self and other, the world that I once had always calls to keep going on, to keep going forward. This is why it's called the way or the path. It's not static. What's around the next bend? What's over the next mountain? Don't you want to know? The only way. You can't read about it. No one can tell you about it. The only way is to go yourself, not stay, not look back to your previous world. Keep going. Second poem, the mountain on which the pupil arrived, on which the, mount, the, the mountain on which the pupil arrive is the place where there is no wisdom to seek and no birth and death to be detached from. It is the place of detachment. I'd rather call it non-attachment. Detachment sounds like there's somebody there who's detached. All is as it is in non-attachment. Everything is just as it is. We're just not grasping onto it, building a self on it. The desert is the place of non-attachment, the desert in which not a blade of grass grows, the region of non-separation, the habitat of the original nature. There is enough grass and water for the ox on the mountain so he can enjoy himself, but the pupil must not just settle down in this place of non-difference. He must go down to the busy road and into the dusty throng of the market. He must carry heavy burdens and pull a fully laden cart. Horses cover him with dust, but he throws himself into the midst of the world of difference in order to liberate worldly beings. Uh, there's a phrase in Zen, power for the way. Once a teacher uh, held up his staff before the assembly and said, why, when the old worthies got here, didn't they stay? No one could answer. So he said, because it has no power for the way. Power for the way comes from being involved in the complexities of our families, of our lives, of our work. This is where our practice has a chance to be challenged and not just become a calm pool that we settle into in a zendo and then forget about when we go out. Life is our practice. Developing wisdom and compassion in the midst of life. This is our challenge. It's not just to come to a zendo. I mean, we have to come to a zendo. Don't let me get you wrong on that and sit with others is tremendously strengthening. But the point is, we have to take it out. That's why lay practice is such a great version of the Buddha way. 
It's not a truncated monastic practice. It's its own beast with great opportunities to truly develop as a human being. That's the point. In a nutshell, that's the point. You must go down to the busy road and into the dusty throng of the market. He must carry heavy burdens and pull a fully laden cart. Horses cover him with dust. But he throws himself or herself into the midst of the world of difference in order to liberate worldly beings. It won't happen from sitting on a mountain. We have to get down into the muck and do our best. This is our challenge. And yet to return again and again to the practice, to Doksan, Teisho, Zazen. But we're always challenged as lay people. And this is the good news. Because when people aren't challenged, uh, what's that line from Milton about a cloistered virtue? If it doesn't function, uh, it's, a, it's a game. It has to function in life where the problems are, where our weaknesses are revealed, where all the issues we try to avoid will be in our face. This is where a practice functions. And this is why, to me, lay practice is the most terrific form of practice right now, given our world. I'm not saying always or ever, but right now. It's the most dynamic because it means we have to be for real. <clears throat> I think I skipped a thing in the first poem, a paragraph, so let me go back to it, because it's quite lovely, I think. When the herdsman has tamed the ox... After repeated efforts, the latter follows him like his shadow. It's true. And practice comes along with it. You don't have to keep looking for it. The pupil succeeds in letting his self and existing beings become permanently one, which means that he succeeds in always letting the right thoughts persist. What is the right thought? The right thought is no thought at all. As uh, George Bernard Shaw said about no drama, he said, no drama is no drama at all. If you don't get the pun, read a no drama. Uh, right thought is no thought at all. The pupil succeeds in letting itself and existing beings become permanently one, which means that he succeeds in always letting the right thoughts persist everywhere. He is one with his heart ox in joy or sorrow, anger, or laughter, which is not an excuse for anger. But sometimes we do get angry. Let that arise and go too. But as long as he is unable to surpass the Buddhas and masters, he must not let up. As long as you can't surpass the Buddhas and masters, you've got to keep it your practice. Don't think, oh, I've got everything I need now. No. In Zen it said, unless a student surpasses uh, their own teacher, they're not really worthy of being a teacher. Uh, each have to find our way to go as far as we can go. <clears throat> the first and second stanzas of the poem denote searching for wisdom and liberating beings, respectively. The true ox must be both in himself Ascending and descending from the truth. When he enters the ordinary world, he never eats fodder growing in others' fields. He never does anything wrong or bad. Let's be clear. Ethics and Zen, people go, like beyond. No. Roshi Kapilo always used to say, Zen is not above morality, morality not below Zen. I would take it further. Ethics are Zen. Uh, there is no way to separate these two things. Uh, form is emptiness, and emptiness is not license. So anybody who hides out 
in saying, oh, well, he's enlightened, so he can get out of there. That's not okay. Uh, uh, he never does anything wrong or bad. Ethics and Zen, emptiness and form, are exactly the same thing. This passage concerns the laws and ethics of the everyday world. The Zen pupil's goal lies in the following vow. Worldly beings are innumerable. I vow to liberate them all. He is, however, not permitted to harm others in any way in so doing. Deeds which spring from the heart ox can never offend morality or laws, but this does not mean that the original deed is hemmed in by the boundaries they set up. The deed is itself the ultimate place from which morality and laws spring from in the beginning. Uh, then he raises the point about the ox doesn't carry him yet. I uh, said that's a mistake. I'm not sure how that got in here at this point. Then third poem, the herdsman has already become his ox in his totality. Even when he goes back into the dusty world, he cannot get dirty. The fish swimming in the sea is not salty himself. The waterfowl is not water-like. There is an old saying that to the person who has sat in Zazen, the sight of the throng of humanity on the busiest, busiest road is as the sight of the trees in the depths of the mountains. The pupil must gain his or her strength actually in falling while going along the way of the training. At the moment when he stumbles and falls, he forgets his ox and, and his self, to which we can only say, Bravo! Bravo! In the instant of forgetting, not only does the willow lose its green and the flower its red, but losing also loses itself. Only when the pupil has passed through this falling and losing himself will he gain a great and genuine awakening, and only then will the breakthrough become genuine. At the moment of falling, birth and death are lost. Even nirvana is lost. They are all truly themselves in this losing. If the pupil has succeeded in getting here, then he is beyond the criticism of even Buddhas and masters. One hears his mighty laugh everywhere. It is recount, recounted that Master Wei Shang climbed a mountain one night, looked at the moon, and broke into a great laugh that is supposed to have resounded for 30 miles. Taming the ox, which is a time of continual training, is also known as gradually letting the holy body grow. After the breakthrough, Daito, the greatest Japanese Zen master, spent 20 years of his life as a beggar under a bridge, and his spiritual heir, Master Kanzan, worked as a farmhand and herdsman in a remote mountain village. All the Chinese masters did similar things. Uh, here is where in the old days uh, someone may begin teaching at this point. It is uh, a ways yet to continue, but these days probably uh, we start teaching much sooner uh, because the times call us to, and we do the best we can. Uh, dropping, in the sense of falling, you know, as he alludes to, is really in dropping self-centeredness, dropping the self as the center of all our thoughts, all our internal drama with me, myself, and I uh, sitting splendidly on its throne, everyone else like a planet revolving around that sun. When everything falls down like London Bridge, uh, for a moment at least, that whole scenario is wiped away. So I want to read you a little something that I got an email from, uh, you might know the publication. It used to be Shambhala's Son, it's now Buddha's Voice. Uh, it's a good, interesting magazine. It came originally out of Trungpa's work, but uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, but it covers a lot of, a lot of Zen. Uh, so this was a, a little article that came out, I guess, in the last issue. About It's written by Peter Coyote in 2008. Does everyone know Peter Coyote? Uh, he was originally one of the diggers in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco in the 60s, and then became an actor, very well known. 
He's the voiceover of a lot of uh, NPR documentaries. You'll see him, Peter Coyote. He's been practicing Zen for many years, um, uh, probably 40, but um, became a priest in 2015, I think, out of Green Gulch, Tassajara, which is essentially non koan practice, just sitting. Uh, he's a very interesting character. Uh, it's a celebrity, really. So I didn't want to read his piece to start with. I went, oh boy, here we go. Another celebrity writing about their spiritual experience. But I finally took a look at it. And the first half of it talks about how painful 40 years ago going to Sashin was. And it's quite hysterically funny. But it's a little uh, much in terms of how the Sashin, there was very formal, very Japanese-like Sashin, which aren't like our Sashin. But then in 2009, he had something open for him after 40 years of practice and really not going to Sashin. And part of the point I'm reading this for is to remind everyone how important Sashin is. Uh, it's where we can really cook up uh, without having to uh, be involved in all the other necessities of our life. It's a great opportunity. So here it is. He wrote, in the first week of December 2009, I was 68 years old. Infirmity and dying were in the forefront of my mind. 45 years earlier, I had contracted hepatitis C from shooting drugs. It had remained undiagnosed until the late 1990s, by which time the disease had been constricting and destroying my liver cells for all those years. My youth had left, snatching as it exited the firm outlines of my body and my once distinct jaw and uncreased neck. The backs of my hands were dotted with liver spots and shadows pooled below my eyes. My stamina had diminished and like most people who have aged beyond the notice of today's youthful diversions, my acting career had settled into a stasis with no promise of any breakthroughs pending. Sickness, old age, and death had become tangible to me in ways that had only been romantic posturing in my 20s. It was now inconvert incontrovertible that in a conceivable future, everything I held dear, every memory and achievement, every treasure, including my own body, would be stripped from me. That is the central, unavoidable fact of human existence and a fundamental tenet of Buddhism, and when it changed from a notion into a certainty, my perspective changed with it, particularly my ideas about time. Looking backwards, the lengthening succession of dead friends and family disappeared into emptiness like a black thread being unspooled into a tub of ink. The only uncertainty in my future was speculation about how savagely, savagely sickness, old age, and death would claim their due. With these thoughts as unpleasant companions, I decided to finally sit another seven-day session. It was December, again, this time time for Ohatsu, the great cold session. Session are always rough, and the first three days were particularly difficult this year. Though my shaking and convulsions have sub had subsided many years before, and I could sit it solidly as those senior monks I'd once envied, my body was 40 years older. So I guess he's gone to other session occasionally during the years. The pain in my knees was intense, debilitating, and distracting to the degree that during a private audience with my teacher in the middle of the third day, I confessed to him that I would have to leave the session because I could not bear the pain any longer. He was mildly critical of me for not paying closer attention to my body and for trying to bull my way through. You're nearly 70, he said. It's hard to admit that all your cards are on the table now and that you have none left to draw. You'll have to play the ones you have as best you can. That is the central fact of your existence. That is reality. And you'll have to adjust to that. You are living what we mean when we say seeing without delusion. You have only one set of knees and you need to take care of them. If you have to sit in a chair, sit in a chair. Don't cripple yourself trying to be tough or refusing to recognize the reality of your body or your age. He was correct, of course. 
and it pinpointed the underlying depression amplifying my physical pain. After our conversation, I began alternating meditation periods between my cushion and a chair, calculating backwards from mealtime so that the meditation period before a meal, and they do orioki seated on the floor, that is, you're seated in the zendo, you put out your bowls, you set them out, uh, and then the server comes around, but you never change your posture. You're seated in the zendo. You have no relief from that. So he would calculate backwards from meal time, set the meditation period before a meal, which I preferred to take on my cushion, not sitting up in a chair, was done in a chair. This relieved the stress on my knees and the consequent reduction of pain allowed me to refocus and dedicate my efforts wholeheartedly. I aligned myself to the schedule without resistance and was able to focus my concentration on a question that had arisen for me on the session's first day. So it's interesting, though it sounds like he's been doing shikantaza, he segued into something closer to an inquiry, maybe fully into an inquiry, like who's hearing or something like that. It was a simple question I had condensed into a short mnemonic phrase. What is it? That was his question. What is it? Mental shorthand for the larger question, what is it I'm missing or still searching for? What is it? By the end of day four, I was completely absorbed in it. My question accompanied each inhale and exhale and resided within me, simmering on a back burner, whether meditating, walking, or eating. What is it? It floated through my dreams. On the sixth day, in the late afternoon, the light outside was thinning, and we began a period of rapid kinhin. Our route began by exiting a side door, circumambulating the rough porch girding the building, re-entering through the door at the opposite corner, threading a path through the zendo, and out the first door again. Uh, he may be at Green Gulch. Uh, I don't know. Uh, she's Tar Sahara. He may have even built, been up at, I know he was a friend of Gary Snyder's. He might even have been at Ring of Bone, the Zendo that I was up at with Nelson Foster uh, for one session. It's the only time I went there. The wood, but it sounds like that kind of outdoor place. It's up in the, up in the mountains. The wood underfoot was bracingly cold and its rough texture stimulating. The rapid walking increased my circulation and alertness and was a balm to my sore joints and muscles. The afternoon fog, oh, it is, must be Green Gulch, creeping in from the ocean, was obscuring the edges of the hills, sending tendrils slithering through the grass like a vigorous living entity. I had just stepped out the door onto the porch. Perhaps it was the second or third round, but I had just begun my course down the building's long side. I remember my hands were folded formally against my navel. I guess that's how they do it, a little lower down. Aiken Roshi said, in Kinin, your arms should be straight down and then at right angles, straight across, wherever that comes out. I've seen, not here, but in other places, people like doing Kinin like this. No, no, it's right angles. Uh, but he said he has his hands against his navel. My gaze was unfocused. And I remember a portion of the swishing black robe and flashing heels of the person in front of me. Several paces after passing through the door, a bird began to shriek from very nearby. It was as loud and startling as if it was sitting on my shoulder, and its plaint was unrelenting. Today, I know it was a camp jay, but I wasn't aware of that at the moment because my concentration was purloined by my question. And the bird's shriek was an irritant. Eek! 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 It cried, strident, insistent, obliterating all thought. Suddenly, in that momentary emptiness, its cries were transformed, and I heard them as it, 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 the indisputable answer to my question. I took one more step in the world as I had always experienced it, ended. I cannot describe what happened next, because in that instant language and thought fell entirely away from my existence. The boundaries between in here and out there 
disappeared. The world remained recognizable as it had always been, but completely stripped of descriptive language and concepts. Completely stripped of descriptive language and concepts. Everything appeared to be a phantom of itself, luminous, but without weight or substance. I had been replaced. The closest I can come to describing what I felt was an awareness with no physical location, inseparable from the entire universe. Everything was precisely as it had come to be. The world was perfect, without time, eternal, and coming and going, as it had always been. Every doubt that I had ever harbored about Zen practice fell away. The timid, fearful self I had been defending, aggrandizing, comforting, and trying to improve for my entire life had been relieved of duty, and everything was fine without him. There was nothing I had to do. I knew irrefutably that this was what I had been searching for since I first picked up a book about Zen when I was 16 years old. In the next instant, I understood that it was not all that important.